like no introductions. I don't even need to say anything. <laughs> one more time, ladies and gentlemen. One more time. <laughs> gentlemen, the floor is yours. Are you technically there? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Richard. <laughs> Good morning, people. How are you? Great. Good morning. Good morning. Turned out, uh, what we generally do is uh, you ask the questions and we answer them to the best of our ability. <laughs> it seems to kind of work out all right for any show, any subject that we can help you with. Uh, look at this man. Isn't he classy? Yes. <laughs> I've been that way for as long as I've known him, that's a long time. <laughs> I call him old money. <laughs> we met at uh, Universal, I remember the day. And when we got together and uh, talked a little bit, I found out one morning that I was to come in for a six million dollar man. I played a fellow who they had before it didn't work. And then the first day I was shooting, I learned something for this guy. I came early. <laughs> he came earlier. <laughs> he always used to come. For, he'd be come before, you know, the, the cameraman was there or anything. And uh, I, I understood it. I understood it because then, if you have a scene to play, you, you want to work it out. You want to work out the stage and what, you know, what it is, and, and he'd go and do that, too. And also, he'd uh, step up and have some coffee before anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I learned that from a, a, a young, young lady at the time who was about 60 when I started the Big Valley. Barbara <laughs> Stanwyck was a wonderful teacher. And Richard knows he worked with her many, many, many times. He did a lot of our Big Valley shows. But anyway, uh, from her I learned to be on time, and which was to beat her, was to be early. <laughs> be on time, know your lines, hit your marks, and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> You'll go a long way. Here we are. That's true. That's so true. Yeah. Well, um, the, thing, the thing about it all is, um, is to uh, realize you're telling a story. And uh, you, you can do it in many ways. Uh, I meet all the great, great uh, actors, Spencer Tracy. And uh, I asked him one day when he was sitting outside, uh, um, acting, don't know too much about it. But don't ever get caught doing it. <laughs> we have some questions from uh, from anybody. That... Okay. Go ahead. Uh, we don't have a mic out there. Of course I, I don't. Have one. I probably there. don't need one. Okay. <laughs> Everybody in here knows that. Watch out um, for her. <laughs> don't tell. My question is for you from Big Valley. Okay. The very first episode of Big Valley, Palm of Glory, that I watched a million times with my grandfather because he loved Big Valley. You were so proficient on that horse. Did you grow up riding horses? No, I didn't. Uh, even though I'm from Kentucky, where the racehorses are from, I, I did maybe some pleasure horse riding, you know, like you would normally do. But once I knew I uh, was going to do the show, I, I got with some real professional cowboys. And, uh, one, a couple of them, two brothers, they were world champion trick ropers, and they performed in Madison Square Gardens when they were young, and um, so they were very good, and uh, they taught me the calf rope and, uh, and do all the horse mounts and uh, everything, but, you know, being that young and starting out, it's very exciting, and uh, <clears throat> of course, now, at the age that you get to now is um, you kind of wished that you'd used your stuntman <laughs> because you know at those ages you feel you're invincible and, 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 uh, and it was fun and it made the day go faster well I'll tell you 
Indian Valley is what it was called, north of uh, the studio. And I came in one day, and they do these things uh, sort of for very special things. And there was this great big tall thing going on. And uh, I, I came closer, and there was a there was a platform, you know, holding it up. And then I see that there was a big thing going on. And uh, when I when I looked up, uh, I said, "What's going on here?" And then and then they then they say, "Look up, really look up." And when I looked up, it was him. <laughs> <laughs> and then he 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 works his way down. He says. Hello, Dick. I said, what are you doing? Are you trying to put us out of business or something like that? <laughs> no, he said, and with that, he went straight up again. It was one of these things, you know? And, uh, and then he slowly, slowly came down. And then uh, we found someone else who could take us on a, on a, uh, on a ship, <coughs> an airplane. And he said, uh, let's go. And I wanted to drop off some some flowers for... <laughs> Which one was it? <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> Farrah, you know that name? Was she as lovely as she seemed? She was, yes. Um, uh, my wife now, who we've been married almost 20 years, she's blonde, and her first initial is F. <laughs> <laughs> something coincidental in the both, they were both, both wonderful people. <laughs> her name is Faith, and I keep the faith. <laughs> we have a question back there, and then we'll get over here. Yeah. Back there. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, during the fifth season of uh, Six Million Dollar Man, you guys filmed Deadly Countdown, which was filmed here in Florida. Would you mind talking about that? Because you were you, and NASA gave you a lot of access to the facilities over at KSC and stuff like that. I, I remember. Um, was it here? <laughs> yeah, there was some stuff that was actually filmed in uh, underneath the launch pad down at the, the yeah. upper room and things of that nature. And there yeah. Was, uh, well, I, I remember going and I think we did. Uh, the only one I can remember real uh, vividly is the one we did in uh, Cape Canaveral. Cape Canaveral. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And uh, yeah, we, I, I, I got to put on one of the actual uh, space uh, outfits that belonged to one of the astronauts. I can't remember his name, but he happened to be one of the bigger ones because they're all very small people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I got in the suit and the actual people that put him in the suit to go up with me in the suit. And it was like really going through what these guys go through uh, in reality. And and when they close the uh, helmet and you latch it in and you're on a respirator, which you hand carry back then. And they put me in the van, in the same van that they would take them out to the launch pad, went up the elevator in, into the very top of the capsule. And you get in those things, and you know you're upside, you're upside down, looking up. And uh, in this particular episode, there was an emergency that we had to get out of the fire or something. So there's there was three ways to get out of there. One is the elevator, which is obviously <laughs> very slow. The elevator was very slow. The next one was a, a long cable line with a car attached to it, a bucket kind of thing that you jumped into and it slid out miles away. The fastest one was a hole in the wall. You went in feet first, and it, it slid down. It was really slick and fast. And you come out into what they call the uh, uh, rubber room, or the bumper room. And it was maybe from this table to that wall when you come out. And you go down so fast that they, they had astronauts who, of course, you could hold your knees out and, 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 and slow your speed down. But the astronauts wouldn't have time to do that. They won so they had them coming. They would be hitting the wall on the far side. They had several broken legs. They told me that's how fast they come down out of that thing. And uh, I enjoyed it. And I went back up, and I was able to, hope, you know, brace my knees out so I could control my speed. So I, the second time, I took a camera down with me, and I was 
used in the show. You know, it's a great, great sign. They were very cooperative, and unfortunately, uh, we've cut back on NASA now, and yeah. so we don't know what's happening. Good question, Jose? Yeah, um, I know you have the episode, uh, you've seen that many, you've seen that many, Bigfoot? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can tell you a quick one about Bigfoot. Uh, he's a well-known wrestler. Uh, named Andre the Giant. Everybody loved him. And he was about 7'4 and uh, 400 pounds. And, um, he, and when you put him in that suit, he was, he was very big. And we were having this fight, and it was very hot and humid day, and we, uh, in the woods, and the pick me up and throw me, which he did, about 20 feet. <laughs> and then he was to come and take a flying leap and land on top of me. And, and I was lying there, squinting, looking up into the sun, and I see the, this big cloud come over. <laughs> I know it's him, but I don't think I'm going to get smushed. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't even touch me. I mean, I never felt him. That's how great these wrestlers are. And, uh, but he was a wonderful man. He loved to cook. He had a French restaurant in, over in France. Mm -hmm. Just a wonderful, wonderful guy. <coughs> Excuse me. That's just a gentleman. How would you feel about them making a movie version of the Bionic Man? Who would you like to see play your role? Uh, I've never really thought about it. It's been kicked around, as Richard knows, to so many different studios. I don't even I think maybe the the Weinstein brothers might have the rights to it at this time, but they, they, the problem is, for a long time was with the uh, the actual uh, owners of the uh, copyright, which would uh, have been the, uh, the man who wrote it, Martin Cage's family. You know, so Richard would tell you more about those, I, I don't know that. No, well, uh, after it was over, uh, a couple of years afterward, I, uh, I said I'd want to uh, uh, do a two-hour movie. And um, I went around a long time uh, to get anything done. And finally, I, I got it done. And uh, Lee and I were interested. In, <coughs> I was interested in talking to him about it. We haven't been in uh, England. The Queen had invited, invited us uh, for a, a, a uh, flying children of Britain and so forth. So there was uh, Lee and I and, and uh, Dennis. He was with us too, and we thought, well, we'd go uh, uh, to France and go on those, uh, those little canal uh, rides. And uh, in the uh, in the afternoon, the ladies went on to uh, buy something, and uh, he, he quickly took off. So uh, I had a bicycle, and we got around, <laughs> we got around him, and I said. Uh, I said, uh, I've got something to tell you, Steve. <laughs> I'm gonna make a two-hour movie. He said, no chance. <laughs> I've had enough of all this. <laughs> and I said, well, you ought to remember this because it's gonna happen, and it did, and we did three of them. Three of them. Well, did you tell him the one that we did in 89, I think, in Toronto, where we hired this little girl? And she didn't make much doing this two-hour movie, but it was Sandra Bullock. <laughs> she never put us on one of her movies after that. <laughs> that happens. Got a question back there? Yes, Mr. Anderson, you were in Forbidden Planet, which is probably the precursor to all the sci-fi movies that we've watched since then. If you have an anecdote about appearing in that, and my second part of the question was, in the first uh, Six Million Dollar Man movie, Darren McGavin played your character. Did you and Lee uh, have any get-together to decide how uh, Steve and Oscar would interact after you took over the CIA operative uh, Oscar Goldman character from Darren McGavin? You know, let me quickly say, because Darren McGavin was a, was a very good actor, and uh, but he, I think he came from New York and did a lot of stage and stuff. And uh, to me, uh, he did a, a good job, but he was a little too gruff and uh, too rough. And we needed some class 
in there. For this <laughs> oh, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and I was my hand a little more warm that, that I could feel that he, he wasn't just sending me on a mission. He would be, he would, I was his friend also. So that helped uh, for the character relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Anything about Forbidden Planet? Forbidden Planet. Like That's amazing. <laughs> it was on. It was on um, um, MGM. Someone had picked it up by a person, I think, who was Australian. And uh, the studio didn't want to do it. They were old guys now, and they didn't understand what it was all about. However, they they finally said, "All right, well, you can do it." And they, they gave him the second, in, in Metro they had two ways of making pictures. Those that were the best uh, cinematographers and uh, those that were not. So they got the, the, the least uh, uh, cameraman, the least money, and so forth and so on. And, uh, and then I happened to have been asked to play in it too. So they had about three days of shooting. It was all on one stage. The whole picture, stage 24, and it was quite an interesting thing uh, doing that. Then the producer came down, and as he started to talk, someone said, the uh, upstairs wants you. That's the producers. So we all said, uh-oh, here it comes. <laughs> and so he went up there, and, and, and as he walked in, he tells us this, he said, we like you. We're going to spend more money. <laughs> and did they? And did they? And a water pigeon, by the way. The actor. He was oh, he was absolutely wonderful in it. And there were a lot of uh, a lot of uh, things to think of because um, and we all had to do with robots and you know, everything starting and so forth. And, and it, it really it really changed every film. That, that would be ever made afterwards. Uh, all these, uh, uh, little, little, I forget his name, but um, Shapiro, or not Shapiro, but these young guys that were U USC and they were uh, studying it. They, they, they saw this movie and changed the whole thing. Lucas, for example, and uh, uh, they all got that new change. You, you talk about how uh, generations change, but how this changed. It changed everything, and has since been uh, uh, awarded in many ways uh, and uh, copied in many ways. But there's nothing like what happened there, and it had such a wonderful story and a, and a wonderful uh, idea about what goes on up there. <laughs> and we got time for one more question. One more question. Uh, the gentleman had his hand up. First off, Mr. Mayor, I want to thank you for signing my box to me and my little girls. You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much. And I, as I was watching the set, I realized that, I don't want to make the order exactly right, but I think it was the fourth season, you had a stream of very memorable and also, I would think, really challenging episodes. We're almost back to back. You had the return of Bigfoot Two Parter, you had the Bionic Boy, you had the Thunderbird. Those were both two hour movies or long episodes. And then you had the three part Phil Oscar crossover almost back to back. And I was wondering if you recall that time period and was that as challenging and busy, busier than usual for you than as we might expect? Well, um, <clears throat> seemed like most of the series I've done have been action packed. And I don't ever want to do another show with the word the in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> The season is nice for office, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's uh, when we finally finished, and he said, "You want to do a TV movie, a two-hour movie?" I said, "No." <laughs> but he talked me into doing three more. And then after that, I, I was trying to get rid of the Steve Austin characterization, you know, to be labeled with that forever, which is why we're here, I guess. <laughs> I was asked to do uh, the 
the Fall Guy, which I thought that would be great because if it's, a, if it's a, any success at all, they'll forget Six Mill and all the help. So uh, five years of that, and they even wanted to go and do more, but I had worn my body out after five years and said, I, I kind of have to take a break. And, but it's still Six Mill is uh, the show. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Just amazing. There's just one final thing I'd like to say. The Vietnam War had just ended. Everybody was poor. Everybody hated the whole thing. And this was a time when this movie came along. And uh, when it came along, they had us on Friday night. And then uh, just a simple uh, Comedian knocked us off after the third show. Mm -hmm. So uh, the studio, I don't know how whether you had anything to do with it, but they put us on Sunday night at 8 o'clock. Now, how about that? I got a phone call on the second week saying, Rich, it's terrific. We're number one. <laughs> number one. And we were for all that time. And this, that when they started seeing this and watching what he was doing, uh, they they all said we're, we're watching at eight o'clock on Sunday night the whole country and they all said There's, there, 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 we have something that we didn't have before we've got a hero. Yeah. <laughs>